to the debt machine known as the monetary system, hence creating the monetary market paradigm which defines the global economy today. There is one consequence that runs through the entire machine. Inequality. Whether it is the market system which creates a natural gravitation towards monopoly and power consolidation, while also generating pockets of wealthy industries that tower over others regardless of utility, such as the fact that top hedge fund managers on Wall Street now take home over $300 million a year for contributing literally nothing, while a scientist looking for a cure for a disease trying to help humanity might make $60,000 a year if they're lucky. Or whether it is the monetary system, which has class division built right into its structure. For example, if I have $1 million to spare and I put it into a CD at 4% interest, I will make $40,000 a year. No social contribution, no nothing. However, if I'm a lower class person and have to take loans to buy my car or home, I am paying in interest, which, in abstraction, is going to pay that millionaire with the 4% CD. This stealing from the poor to pay the rich is a foundational, built-in aspect of the monetary system, and it could be labeled structural classism. Of course, historically, social stratification has always been deemed unfair, but obviously accepted overall as now 1% of the population owns 40% of the planet's wealth. But material fairness aside, there is something else going on underneath the surface of inequality causing an incredible deterioration in public health as a whole. Well, I think people are often uh, puzzled by the contrast between the material success of our societies, unprecedented levels of wealth, uh, and the many social failings. I mean, you know, if you look at the, the rates of um, drug abuse or violence or self-harm amongst kids um, or mental illness, uh, there's clearly something going deeply wrong with our societies. What the data that I've been describing does is simply shows that intuition that we people have had for hundreds of years that inequality is divisive and socially corrosive, that that intuition is truer than I think we ever imagined. There are very powerful psychological and social effects of inequality, more to do, I suppose, with feelings of, inf of superiority and inferiority, that kind of division, and, and maybe going with the sort of respect, disrespect, people feeling looked down on at the bottom, which, by the way, is why violence is more common in more unequal societies. It's the trigger to violence is so often people feeling looked down on and disrespected. If there is one principle I can emphasize that is the most important principle underlying the prevention of violence, it would be equality. The single most significant factor that affects the rate of violence is the degree of equality versus the degree of inequality in that society. So what one's looking at is a sort of general social dysfunction uh, it's not just one or two things that go wrong as inequality increases. It seems to be everything, whether we're talking about crime or health or mental illness or whatever. One of the really disturbing findings out in public health there is never ever make the mistake of being poor or being born poor. Your health pays for it in endless sorts of ways, something known as the health socioeconomic gradient. As you move down from the highest strata in society in terms of socioeconomic status, every step down, health gets worse for umpteen different diseases, life expectancy gets worse, infant mortality rate, everything you could look at. So a huge issue has been, why is it that uh, this gradient exists? totally simple obvious answer which is if you were chronically sick you're not going to be very productive so health causes drive socioeconomic differences not that in the slightest on the very simple level that you could look at socioeconomic status of a 10 year old and that's going to predict something about their health decades later so that's the direction of causality next one what's it about oh it's perfectly obvious poor people can't afford to go to the doctor it's healthcare access it's got nothing to do with that because you see these same gradients in countries with universal health care, socialized medicine. Okay, next simple explanation. 
oh, on the average, the poorer you are, the more likely you are to smoke, to drink, to all sorts of lifestyle risk factor stuff. Yeah, those contribute, but careful studies have shown that explains maybe about a third of the variability. So what's left, and what's left is having a ton to do with the stress of poverty. So the poorer you are, starting off being, you know, the person who's one dollar income behind Bill Gates, the poorer you are in this country, on the average, the worse your health is. This tells us something really important. The health connection with poverty, it's not about being poor, it's about feeling poor. Increasingly, we recognize that um, chronic stress is an important influence on health, but the most important sources of stress are the quality of social relations. And if there is anything that lowers the quality of social relations, it is the socioeconomic stratification of society. What science has now shown is that regardless of material wealth, the stress of simply living in a stratified society leads to a vast spectrum of public health problems. And the greater the inequality, the worse they become. Life expectancy, longer and more equal countries, drug abuse, less and more equal countries, mental illness, less and more equal countries, social capital, meaning the ability of people to trust each other, naturally greater in more equal countries, educational scores, higher in more equal countries, homicide rates, less in more equal countries, crime and rates of imprisonment, less in more equal countries, it goes on and on. Infant mortality, obesity, teen birth rate, less and more equal countries. And perhaps most interesting, innovation, greater in more equal countries, which challenges the age-old notion that a competitive, stratified society is somehow more creative and inventive. Moreover, a study done in the UK called the Whitehall Study confirmed that there is a social distribution of disease as you go from the top of the socioeconomic ladder to the bottom. For example, it was found that the lowest rungs of the hierarchy had a fourfold increase of heart disease based mortality compared to the highest rungs. And this pattern exists irrespective of access to health care. Hence, the worse a person's relative financial status, the worse their health is going to be on average. This phenomenon is rooted in what could be termed psychosocial stress, and it is at the foundation of the greatest social distortions plaguing our society today. Its cause? The monetary market system. Make no mistake, the greatest destroyer of ecology, the greatest source of waste and depletion and pollution, the greatest purveyor of violence war, crime, poverty, animal abuse and inhumanity, the greatest generator of social and personal neuroses, mental disorders, depression, anxiety, not to mention the greatest source of social paralysis, stopping us from moving into new methodologies for personal health, global sustainability and progress on this planet, is not some corrupt government or legislation not some rogue corporation or banking cartel, not some flaw of human nature, and not some secret hidden cabal that controls the world. It is in fact the socio-economic system itself at its very foundation. Let's imagine for a moment we had the option to redesign human civilization from the ground up. What if, hypothetically speaking, we discovered an exact replica of the planet Earth, and the only difference between this new planet and our current one is that human evolution had not occurred. It was an open palette. No countries, no cities, no pollution, no republicans. Just a pristine, open environment. So, what would we do? Well, first we need a goal, right? And it's safe to say that goal would be to survive. And not to just survive, but to do so in an optimized, healthy, prosperous way. 
Most people indeed desire to live and they would prefer to do so without suffering. Therefore, the basis of this civilization needs to be as supportive and hence sustainable for human life as possible. Taking into account the material needs of all the world's people while trying to remove anything that could hurt us in the long run. That goal of, say, maximum sustainability understood, the next question regards our method. What kind of approach do we take? Well, let's see. Last I checked, politics was the method of social operation on Earth. So what do the doctrines of the Republicans, liberals, conservatives, or socialists have to say about societal design? Hmm, not a damn thing. Okay then, what about religion? Surely the great creator had to have left some blueprints somewhere. No, nothing I can find. Okay then, so what's left? It appears something called science. Science is unique in that its methods demand not only that the ideas proposed be tested and replicated, but everything science comes up with is also inherently falsifiable. In other words, unlike religion and politics, science has no ego, and everything it suggests accepts the possibility of being proven wrong eventually. It holds on to nothing and evolves constantly. Well, that sounds natural enough to me. So then, Based on the current state of scientific knowledge in the early 21st century, along with our goal of maximum sustainability for the human population, how do we begin the actual process of construction? Well, the first question to ask, what do we need to survive? The answer, of course, are planetary resources. Whether it is the water we drink, the energy we use, the raw materials we utilize to create tools and shelter, the planet hosts an inventory of resources, many of which are demanded for our survival. So, given that reality, it then becomes critical to figure out what we have and where it is. This means we need to conduct a survey. We simply locate and identify every physical resource on the planet we can, along with the amount available at each location, from the deposits of copper, to the most potent locations for wind farms to produce energy, to the natural freshwater springs, to an assessment of the amount of fish in the ocean, to the most prime arable land for food cultivation, etc. But since we humans are going to be consuming these resources over time, we then realize that not only do we need to locate and identify, we also need to track. We need to make sure we don't run out of any of this stuff. That would be bad. And this means not only tracking our rates of use, but the rates of earthly regeneration as well, such as how long it takes for, say, a tree to grow or a spring to replenish. This is called dynamic equilibrium. In other words, if we use up trees faster than they can be grown back, we have a serious problem, for it is unsustainable. So then, how do we track this inventory, especially when we recognize that all of this stuff is scattered everywhere? We have large mineral mines in what we call Africa, energy concentrations in the Middle East, huge tidal power possibilities on the Atlantic coast of North America, the largest supply of fresh water in Brazil, etc. Well, once again, good old science has a suggestion. It's called systems theory. Systems theory recognizes that the fabric of the natural world, from human biology, to the earthly biosphere, to the gravitational pull of the solar system itself, is one huge, synergistically connected system, fully interlinked. Just as human cells connect to form our organs, and the organs connect to form our bodies, and since our bodies cannot live without the earthly resources of food, air, and water, we are intrinsically connected to the earth, and so on. So, as nature suggests, we take all of this inventory and tracking data and create a system to manage it. A global resource management system, in fact, to account for every relevant resource on the planet. There is simply no logical alternative if our goal as a species is survival in the long run. We have to keep track as a whole. That understood, we can now consider production. How do we use all this stuff? What will our process of production be, and what do we need to consider to make sure it is as optimized as possible to maximize our sustainability? Well, the first thing that jumps right out at us is the fact that we need to constantly try and preserve. 
The planet's resources are essentially finite, so it is important that we be strategic. Strategic preservation is key. The second thing we recognize is that some resources are really not as good as others in their performance. In fact, some of this stuff, when put into use, has a terrible effect on the environment, which invariably hinders our own health. For example, oil and fossil fuels, no matter how you cut it, release some pretty destructive agents into the environment. Therefore, it is critical we do our best to use such things only when we really have to, if at all. Fortunately for us, we see a ton of solar, wind, tidal, wave, heat differential, and geothermal possibilities for energy production. So we can strategize objectively about what we use and where to avoid what could be called negative retroactions, or anything that results from production or use that damages the environment and hence ourselves. We will call this strategic safety to couple in with our strategic preservation. But production strategies do not stop there. We are going to need an efficiency strategy for the actual mechanics of production itself. And what we find is that there are roughly three specific protocols we must adhere to. One, every good we produce must be designed to last as long as possible. Naturally, the more things break down, the more resources we are going to need to replace them and the more waste produced. Two, when things do break down or are no longer usable for whatever reason, it is critical that we harvest or recycle as much as we possibly can. So the production design must take this into account directly at the very earliest stages. Three, quickly evolving technologies such as electronics, which are subject to the fastest rates of technological obsolescence, would need to be designed to foreshadow and accommodate physical updates. The last thing we want to do is throw away an entire computer system just because it has only one broken part or is outdated. So we simply design the components to be easily updated, part by part, standardized and universally interchangeable, foreshadowed by the current trend of technological change. And when we realize that the mechanisms of strategic preservation, strategic safety, and strategic efficiency are purely technical considerations, devoid of any human opinion or bias. We simply program these strategies into a computer which can weigh and calculate all the relevant variables, allowing us to always arrive at the absolute best method for sustainable production based on current understandings. And while that might sound complex, all it is is a glorified calculator not to mention such multivariate decision-making and monitoring systems are already used across the world today for isolated purposes. It is simply a process of scaling it out. So, now we not only have our resource management system, but also a production management system, both of which are easily computer automated to maximize efficiency, preservation, and safety. The informational reality is that the human mind, or even a group of humans, cannot track what needs to be tracked. It must be done by computers. And it can be. And this brings us to the next level, distribution. What sustainability strategies make sense here? Well, since we know that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, and since energy is required to power transport machines, the less transport distance, the more efficient. Producing goods in one continent and shipping them over to another only makes sense if the goods in question simply cannot be produced in the target area. Otherwise, it is nothing but wasteful. We must localize production so distribution is simple, fast, and requires the least amount of energy. We'll call this the proximity strategy, which simply means we reduce the travel of goods as much as possible, whether raw materials or finished consumer products. Of course, it might also be important to know what goods we are transporting and why, and this falls under the category of demand. And demand is simply what people need to be healthy and to have a high quality of life. The spectrum of material human needs range from core life-supporting necessities, such as food, clean water, shelter, to social and recreational goods, which allow for relaxation and personal social enjoyment both important factors in human and social health overall. 
So, very simply, we take another survey. People describe their needs. Demand is assessed and production begins based on that demand. And since the level of demand of different goods will naturally fluctuate and change around different regions, we need to create a demand distribution tracking system, so to avoid overruns and shortages. Of course, this idea is old news. It is used in every major store chain today to make sure they keep up with their inventory. Only this time we are tracking on a global scale. But wait a minute, we really can't fully understand demand if we don't account for the actual usage of the good itself. Is it logical and sustainable for every single human to, say, have one of everything made regardless of their usage? No, that would be simply wasteful and inefficient. If a person has a need for a good, but that need is only for, say, 45 minutes a day on average, it would be much more efficient if that good was made available to them and to others when needed. Many forget that it isn't the good that they want, it is the purpose of that good. When we realize that the good itself is only as important as its utility, we see that external restriction, or what we might call today ownership, is extremely wasteful and environmentally illogical in a fundamental economic sense. So, we need to devise a strategy called strategic access. This would be the foundation of our demand distribution tracking system, which makes sure we can meet the demand of the population's needs for access of whatever they need, when they need it. And as far as physically obtaining the goods, centralized and regional access centers all make sense for the most part. Placed in close proximity to the population, and a person would simply come in, take the item, use it, and when finished, return it when it is no longer needed. Sort of how a library works today. In fact, these centers could not only exist in the community in the way we see local stores today, but specialized access centers would exist in specific areas where often certain goods are utilized, saving more energy with less repeat transport. And once this demand tracking system is in order, it is tied into our production management system and, of course, into our resource management system, hence creating a unified, dynamically updating global economic management machine that simply makes sure we remain sustainable, starting with securing the integrity of our finite resources, moving to make sure we only create the best, most strategic goods possible, while distributing everything in the most intelligent and efficient way. And the unique result of this preservation-based approach, which is intuitively counter to many, is that this logical, ground-up, empirical process of preservation and efficiency, which can only define true human sustainability on this planet, would likely enable something never before seen in human history. Access abundance. Not just for a percentage of the global population, but the entire civilization. This economic model, as was just generalized, this responsible systems approach to total earth resource management and processes, designed again to do nothing less than take care of humanity as a whole in the most efficient and sustainable way, could be termed a resource-based economy. The idea was defined in the 1970s by structural engineer Jacques Fresco. He understood back then that society was on a collision course with nature and itself, unsustainable on every level. And if things didn't change, we would destroy ourselves one way or another. Are all these things you're saying, Jacques, uh, could they be built with what we know today, or are some of these things, are you guessing based on what we know today? No. All of these things can be built with what we know today. It would take 10 years to change the surface of the Earth to rebuild the world into a second Garden of Eden. The choice lies with you. The stupidity of a nuclear arms race, the development of weapons, trying to solve your problems politically by electing this political party or that political party, that all politics is immersed in corruption. Let me say it again. Communism, socialism, fascism, the Democrats, the liberals, we want to absorb human beings. 
All organizations that believe in a better life for man, there are no Negro problems or Polish problems or Jewish problems or Greek problems or women's problems. They're human problems. I'm not afraid of anybody. I don't work for anyone. No one can discharge me. I have no boss. I am afraid to live in the society we live in today. Our society cannot be maintained by this type of incompetency. It was great, the free enterprise system, about 35 years ago. That was the last of its usefulness. Now we've got to change our way of thinking or perish. The horror movies of the future will be our society, the way it didn't work. And politics would be part of a horror movie. Well, lots of people today use the term cold science because they're analytical. And they don't even know what analytical means. Science means closer approximations of the way the world really works. So it's telling the truth is what it is. A scientist doesn't try to get along with people. They tell them what their findings are. They have to question all things. And if some scientist comes up with an experiment that shows certain materials have certain strength, other scientists have to be able to duplicate that experiment and come up with the same results. Even if a scientist feels that an airplane wing, due to mathematics or calculations, can hold up a given amount of weight, they still pile sandbags on it to see when it breaks. And they say, you know, my calculations are right, or they're not correct. I love that system because it's free of bias and free of thinking that math can solve all the problems. You have to put your math to test also. I think that every system that can be put to test should be put to test and that all decisions should be based upon research. A resource-based economy is simply the scientific method applied to social concern, an approach utterly absent in the world today. Society is a technical invention, and the most efficient methods of optimized human health, physical production, distribution, city infrastructure, and the like, reside in the field of science and technology, not politics or monetary economics. It operates in the same systematic way as, say, an airplane, and there is no Republican or liberal way to build an airplane. Likewise, nature itself is the physical referent we use to prove our science, and it is a set system, emerging only from our increased understanding of it. In fact, it has no regard for what you subjectively think or believe to be true. Rather, it gives you an option. You can learn and fall in line with its natural laws and conduct yourself accordingly, invariably creating good health and sustainability, or you can go against the current to no avail. It doesn't matter how much you believe you can just stand up right now and walk on the wall next to you. The law of gravity will not allow it. If you do not eat, you will die. If you are not touched as an infant, you will die. As harsh as it may sound, nature is a dictatorship. And we can either listen to it and come in harmony with it, or suffer the inevitable adverse consequences. So, a resource-based economy is nothing more than a set of proven, life-supporting understandings where all decisions are based upon optimized human and environmental sustainability. It takes into account the empirical life ground, which every human being shares as a need, regardless, again, of their political or religious philosophy. There is no cultural relativism to this approach. It isn't a matter of opinion. Human needs are human needs, and having access to the necessities of life, such as clean air, nutritious food, and clean water, along with a positively reinforcing, stable, nurturing, and non-violent environment, is demanded for our mental and physical health, our evolutionary fitness, and hence the species' survival itself. A resource-based economy would be based upon available resources. You can't just bring a lot of people to an island or build a city of 50,000 people without having access to the necessities of life. So when I use the term a comprehensive systems approach, I'm talking about doing an inventory of the area first and determining what that area can supply not just architectural approach, not just design approach, but design must be based on all of the requirements to enhance human life. <laughs>
And that's what I mean by an integrated way of thinking. Food, clothing, shelter, warmth, love, all those things are necessary. If you deprive people of any of them, you have a lesser human being, less capable of functioning. As previously outlined, a resource-based economy's ground-up, global, systems approach to extraction, production and distribution is based upon a set of true economic mechanisms, or strategies, which guarantee efficiency and sustainability in every area of the economy. So, continuing this train of thought regarding logical design, what is next in our equation? Where does all this materialize? Cities. The advent of the city is a defining feature of modern civilization. Its role is to enable efficient access to the necessities of life, along with increased social support and community interaction. So how would we go about designing an ideal city? What shape should we make it? Square? Trapezoid? Well, given we're going to be moving around the thing, we might as well make it as equidistant as possible for ease. Hence, the circle. What should the city contain? Well, naturally we need a residential area, a goods production area, a power generation area, an agricultural area. But we also need nurturing as human beings, hence culture, nature, recreation, and education. So let's include a nice open park, an entertainment events area for cultural purposes and socializing, and educational and research facilities. And since we're working with a circle, it seems rational to place these functions in belts based on the amount of land required for each goal, along with ease of access. Very good. Now, let's get down to specifics. First, we need to consider the core infrastructure, or intestines, of the city organism. These would be the water, good, waste, and energy transport channels. Just as we have water and sewage systems under our cities today, we would extend this channeling concept to integrate waste recycling and delivery itself. No more mailman or garbage men. It is built right in. We could even use automated pneumatic tubes and similar technologies. Same goes for transport. It needs to be integrated and strategically designed to reduce or even remove the need for wasteful, independent automobiles. Electric trams, conveyors, transveyors, and maglevs, which can take you virtually anywhere in the city, even up and down, along with connecting you to other cities as well. And of course, in the event an automobile is required, it is automated by satellite for safety and integrity. In fact, this automation technology is in working order right now. Automobile accidents kill about 1.2 million people every single year, injuring about 50 million. This is absurd and doesn't have to occur. Between efficient city design and automated driverless cars, this death toll can be virtually eliminated. Agriculture. Today, through our haphazard cost-cutting industrial methods, using pesticides, excessive fertilizers, and other means, we have successfully destroyed much of the arable land on this planet not to mention also extensively poisoning our bodies. In fact, industrial and agricultural chemical toxins now show up in virtually every human being tested, including infants. Fortunately, there is a glaring alternative, the soilless mediums of hydroponics and aeroponics, which also reduce nutrient and water requirements by up to 75% of our current usage. Food can now be organically grown on an industrial scale in enclosed vertical farms, such as in 50-story, one-acre plots, virtually eliminating the need for pesticides and hydrocarbons in general. This is the future of industrial food cultivation, efficient, clean, and abundant. So, such advanced systems would be, in part, what comprise our agricultural belt, producing all the food required for the entire city's population, with no need to import anything from the outside, saving time, waste and energy. And speaking of energy, the energy belt would work in a systems approach to extract electricity from our abundant renewable mediums, specifically wind, solar, geothermal and heat differentials, and if near water potentials, tidal and wave power. To avoid intermittency and make sure a positive net energy return occurs, these mediums would operate in an integrated system powering each other when needed, while storing excessive energy to large supercapacitors under the ground, so nothing can go to waste. 
And not only does the city power itself, particular structures will also power independently and generate electricity through photovoltaic paints, structural pressure transducers, the thermal couple effect, and other current but underutilized technologies. But of course, this begs the question, how does this technology and goods in general get created in the first place? This brings us to production. The industrial belt, apart from having hospitals and the like, would be the hub of factory production. Completely localized overall, it would of course obtain raw materials by way of the global resource management system just discussed, with demand being generated by the population of the city itself. As far as the mechanics of production, we need to discuss a new, powerful phenomenon which was sparked very recently in human history and is on pace to changing everything. It's called mechanization, or the automation of labor. Well, if you look uh, around you, you'll notice that almost everything that we use today uh, is built automatically. Uh, your shoes, your clothes, your home appliances, your car, and so on, uh, they are all built by machines uh, in an automatic way. Can we say that the society has not been influenced by these major technological advancements? Of course not. These um, systems really dictate new structures and new needs, and they make a lot of other things obsolete. So we've been going up uh, in the development and use of technology in an exponential way. So definitely, Automation is going to continue. You cannot stop the technologies that just make sense. Labor automation through technology is at the bottom of every major social transformation in human history. From the agricultural revolution and the invention of the plow, to the industrial revolution and the invention of the powered machine, to the information age we live in now through essentially the invention of advanced electronics and computers. And with regard to advanced production methods today, Mechanization is now evolving on its own, moving away from the traditional method of assembling component parts into a configuration into an advanced method of creating entire products in one single process. Like most engineers, I'm fascinated by biology because it's so full of examples of extraordinary pieces of engineering. Um, and the, the, what biology is, is the study of things that copy themselves, of course. That, that, good a definition of life as we've got. Again, as an engineer, I've always been intrigued by the idea of machines that would copy themselves. RetWrap is a three-dimensional printer. That's to say, it's a printer that you plug into a computer, and instead of making two-dimensional sheets of paper with patterns on, it makes real, physical, three-dimensional objects. Now, there's nothing new about that. Uh, 3D printers have been around for about 30 years. The big thing about RetWrap is that it prints most of its own parts. So if you've got one, you can make another one and give it to a friend, as well as being able to print lots of useful things. From the simple printing of basic household goods in your home, to the printing of an entire automobile body in one swoop, advanced automated 3D printing now has the potential to transform virtually every field of production, including home construction. The contour crafting is actually a fabrication technology the so-called 3D printing, when you directly build a 3D object from a computer model. Using contour crafting, it will be possible to build a 2,000 square foot home entirely by the machine in one day. The reason that uh, people are interested in automating construction is that it really brings a lot of benefits. Uh, for example, Construction is pretty labor intensive, and uh, although it provides job for uh, the sector of the society, it also has issues uh, and uh, complications. For example, construction is the most dangerous job that there is. Uh, it is worse than mining and agriculture. It has got the highest level of fatality almost in every country. Another issue is the waste. Um, an average home in the United States has three to seven tons of waste. Uh, so this is huge uh, if we look at the impact of construction and, and knowing that about 40% of all materials in the world are used in construction. So a big 
waste of uh, energy and resources and big damage to the environment as well. Making homes using hammers and nails and wood with the state of our technology today is really absurd and will go the way of our labor class in regards to manufacturing in the United States. Recently, there was a study by economist David Attor of MIT that states that our middle class is obsolete and being replaced by automation. Quite simply, mechanization is more productive, efficient, and sustainable than human labor in virtually every sector of the economy today. Machines do not need vacations, breaks, insurance, pensions, and they can work 24 hours a day every day. The output potential and accuracy compared to human labor is unmatched. The bottom line, repetitive human labor is becoming obsolete and impractical across the world. And the unemployment you see around you today is fundamentally the result of this evolution of efficiency in technology. For years, market economists have dismissed this growing pattern, which could be called technological unemployment because of the fact that new sectors always seem to emerge to reabsorb the displaced workers. Today, the service sector is the only real hub left and currently employs over 80% of the American workforce, with most industrialized countries maintaining a similar proportion. However, this sector is now being challenged increasingly by automated kiosks, automated restaurants, and even automated stores. Economists today are finally acknowledging what they have been denying for years. Not only is technological unemployment exasperating the current labor crisis we see across the world due to the global economic downturn, but the more the recession deepens, the faster the industries are mechanizing. The catch, which is not realized, is that the faster they mechanize to save money, the more they displace people, the more they reduce public purchasing power. This means that while the corporation can produce everything more cheaply, fewer and fewer people will actually have money to buy anything, regardless of how cheap they become. The bottom line is that the labor for income game is slowly coming to an end. In fact, if you take a moment to reflect on the jobs which are in existence today, which automation could take over right now if applied, 75% of the global workforce could be replaced by mechanization tomorrow. And this is why, in a resource-based economy, there is no monetary market system. No money at all. For there is no need. A resource-based economy recognizes the efficiency of mechanization and accepts it for what it offers. It doesn't fight it like we do today. Why? Because it is irresponsible not to, given any interest in efficiency and sustainability. And this brings us back to our city system. In the center is the central dome, which not only houses the educational facilities and transportation hub, it also hosts the mainframe that runs the city's technical operations. The city is, in fact, one big automated machine. It has sensors and all technical belts to track the progress of agriculture, energy gathering, production, distribution, and the like. Now, would people be needed to oversee these operations in the event of a malfunction or the like? Most probably yes, but that number would decrease over time as improvements continue. However, as of today, maybe 3% of the city population would be needed for this job when you break it down. And I can assure you that in an economic system which is actually designed to take care of you and secure your well-being, without you having to submit to a private dictatorship on a daily basis, usually to a job that is either technically unnecessary or socially pointless, while often struggling with debt that doesn't exist just to make ends meet. I guarantee you people will volunteer their time left and right to maintain and improve a system that actually takes care of them. And coupled with this issue of incentive, comes the common assumption that if there isn't some external pressure for one to work for a living, people will just sit around, do nothing, and turn into fat, lazy blobs. This is nonsense. The labor system we have today is in fact the generator of laziness, not a resolver of it. If you think back to when you were a child, full of life, interested in new things to understand, 
likely creating and exploring. But as time went on, the system pushed you into the focus of figuring out how to make money. And from early education to study at a university, you are narrowed, only to emerge as a creature which serves as a cog in a wheel in a model that sends all the fruits to the upper 1%. Scientific studies have now shown that people are, in fact, not motivated by monetary reward when it comes to ingenuity and creation. The creation itself is the reward. Money, in fact, appears only to serve as an incentive for repetitive, mundane actions, a role we have just now shown can be replaced by machine. So when it comes to innovation, the actual use of the human mind, the monetary incentive has proven to be a hindrance interfering and detracting from creative thought. And this might explain why Nikola Tesla, the Wright brothers, and other inventors who contributed massively to our current world never showed a monetary incentive to do so. Money is, in fact, a false incentive and causes a hundred times more distortion than it does contribution. Good morning, class. Please settle down. The first thing I would like to do is go around the room and ask what everyone would like to be when they grow up. Who would like to go first? Okay, how about you, Sarah? When I grow up, I want to work at McDonald's like my mom. Oh, family tradition, eh? How about you, Linda? When I grow up, I'm going to be a prostitute on the streets of New York City. Oh, glamour girl, huh? Very ambitious. How about you, Tommy? When I grow up, I'm going to be a rich, elitist businessman who works on Wall Street and profits off of the collapse of foreign economies. Enterprising. And great to see some multicultural interest. As stated before, a resource-based economy applies the scientific method to social concern. And this isn't limited to simply technical efficiency. It also has the consideration of human and social well-being directly and what comprises it. What good is a social system if, in the end, it doesn't produce happiness and peaceful coexistence? So it is important to point out that with the removal of the money system and the necessities of life provided, we would see a global reduction in crime by about 95% almost immediately. For there is nothing to steal, embezzle, scam, or the like. 95% of all people in prisons today are there due to some monetary related crime or drug abuse, and drug abuse is a disorder, not a crime. So what about the other 5%, the truly violent, often seeming to some as being violent for the sake of being violent? Are they just evil people? The, the reason that I frankly think it's a waste of time to engage in moral value judgments about uh, people's violence is because it doesn't advance by one iota our understanding of either the causes or the prevention of the violent behavior. People sometimes ask if I believe in forgiving criminals. My answer to that is, no, I don't believe in forgiveness any more than I believe in condemnation. It's only if we as a society can take the same attitude of treating violence as a problem in public health and preventive medicine rather than as a moral evil. Uh, it's only when we make that change in our own attitudes and assumptions and values that we will actually succeed in reducing the level of violence rather than stimulating it, which is what we do now. The more justice you seek, the more hurt you become because there's no thing as justice. There is whatever there is out there. That's it. In other words, if people are conditioned to be racist and bigots, if they're brought up in an environment that advocates that, why do you blame the person for it? They're a victim of a subculture. Therefore, they have to be helped. The point is, we have to redesign the environment that produces aberrant behavior. That's the problem, not putting a person in jail. That's why judges, lawyers, freedom of choice, such concepts are dangerous because it gives you misinformation that the person is bad or that person is a serial killer. Serial killers are made 
just like soldiers become serial killers with a machine gun. They become killing machines, but nobody looks at them as murderers or assassins, because that's natural. So we blame people. We say, well, this guy was a Nazi. He tortured Jews. No, he was brought up to torture Jews. Once you accept the fact that people have individual choices and they're free to make those choices, free to make choices means without being influenced. And I can't understand that at all. All of us are influenced in all our choices by the culture we live in, by our parents, and by the values that dominate. So we're influenced. So they can't be free choices. What's the greatest country in the world? The true answer, I haven't been all over the world and I don't know, know enough about different cultures to answer that question. I don't know anybody that speaks that way. They say, it's good old USA, the greatest country in the world. There's no survey. Have you been to India? No. Have you been to England? No. Have you been to France? No. Uh, what do you make your assumptions on? They can't answer. They get mad at you. They say, well, God damn it, who the hell are you to tell me what to think? You know, don't forget, you're dealing with aberrated people. They're not responsible for their answers. They're victims of culture. That means they've been influenced by their culture. When we consider a resource-based economy, there are often a number of arguments that tend to come up with regard hey, to the efficiency. Hey, uh, hey, uh, now hold on just a minute. Yes? I know what this is. This is called Marxism, buddy. Stalin killed 800 billion people because of ideas like this. My you know, father like died in the right. gulag. No, hold on, this hold on. Communist, fascist. You don't like America, you should just leave. Right, everybody you know just what? calm down. Death to the new world order. Death to the new world order. And as the irrationality of the audience grew, shocked and confused, suddenly the narrator suffered a fatal heart attack. <laughs> and the seemingly communist propaganda film was no more. You know, I've said that sort of thing to people in think tank type of situations and, uh, you know, these Club of Rome types and so forth. Marxist. What Marxist? Where did that come from? You know, they just, they've got this icon they hold on to. It's their holy grail. Uh, and it's such an easy one, you know. People ask if I'm a socialist or a communist or a capitalist, and I say, I'm none of the above, and why do you, th why do you think that those are the only options? All of those political constructs were created by writers who assumed that we lived on a planet of infinite resources. Not a one of those political philosophies even con contemplates that there might be a shortage of anything. I believe that communism, socialism, free enterprise, fascism are part of social evolution. That you can't take a giant step from one culture to another, but they're in between systems. Before there's any ism, we've got a life ground, and the life ground is, as I just described most easily, it's all the conditions required to take your next breath, and that involves the air you breathe, the water you get, the safety you have, the education you can access, all these things that we share and use and that no life in any culture can do without. So we've got to reset down to the life ground, and the life ground is no longer any ism. It's life value analysis. It's simply a matter of historical fact that the dominant intellectual culture of any particular society reflects the interests of the dominant group in that society. Uh, in a slave-owning society, the beliefs about human beings and human rights and so on will reflect the needs of the slave owners. In a society which again is based on the power of uh, certain people to control and profit from the lives and uh, work of millions of others, the dominant intellectual culture will reflect the needs of, of the dominant group. And so that if you look across the board, the 
ideas that pervade psychology and uh, sociology and history and political economy and political science fundamentally reflect certain elite interests and the academics who question that too much uh, tend to get shunted to the side or to be seen as sort of radicals. The dominant values of a culture tend to support and perpetuate what is rewarded by that culture. And in a society where success and status is measured by material wealth, not social contribution, it is easy to see why the state of the world is what it is today. We are dealing with a value system disorder, completely denatured, where the priority of personal and social health have become secondary to the detrimental notions of artificial wealth and limitless growth. And like a virus, this disorder now permeates every facet of government, news media, entertainment, and even academia. And built into its structure are mechanisms of protection from anything that might interfere. Disciples of the monetary market religion, the self-appointed guardians of the status quo, constantly seek out ways to avoid any form of thought which might interfere with their beliefs. The most common of which are projected dualities. If you are not a Republican, you must be a Democrat. If you are not a Christian, you might be a Satanist. And if you feel society can be greatly improved to consider perhaps, I don't know, taking care of everyone, you're just a utopianist. And the most insidious of them all, if you are not for the free market, you must be against freedom itself. I'm a believer in freedom. Every time you hear the word freedom being said anywhere or government interference said anywhere, it means decoded blocking maximization of turning money into more money for private money possessors. That's it. Every other thing they'll say, oh, we need more commodities for people, oh, this is a, a freedom against tyranny and so forth. Every time you see it, you can decode it down to that. And I think you'll find a one-to-one -one correlation with every time they use it. And this is a sense in which we might call it's a syntax, a governing syntax of understanding and of value, so that it governs beneath their own recognition of it. So they may not say, oh, I didn't mean that at all, but in fact, that's what they do. Just like you may speak a grammar, and you have rules of grammar you follow without recognizing what the rules are. And so what we have is what I call the ruling value syntax that underlies this. So every time they use these words, government interference, lack of freedom, or freedom, or uh, progress, or development, you can decode them all to come back to mean that. Of course, when you hear the word freedom, it tends to be in the same sentence with something called democracy. It's fascinating how people today seem to believe that they actually have a relevant influence on what their government does forgetting that the very nature of our system offers everything for sale. The only vote that counts is the monetary vote, and it doesn't matter how much any activist yells about ethics or accountability. In a market system, every politician, every legislation, and hence every government is for sale. And even with the $20 trillion bank bailout starting in 2007, an amount of money which could have changed, say, the global energy infrastructure to fully renewable methods, instead going to a series of institutions that literally do nothing to help society, institutions that could be removed tomorrow with no recourse, the blind conditioning that politics and politicians exist for the public well-being still continues. The fact is, politics is a business, no different than any other in a market system, and they care about their self-interest before anything else. I don't really, honestly, deep down believe in political action. I think the system contracts and expands as it wants to. It accommodates these changes. I think the civil rights movement was an accommodation on the part of those who own the country. I think they see where their self-interest lies. They see a certain amount of freedom seems good, an illusion of liberty. Give these people a voting day every year so that they'll have the illusion of meaningless choice. Meaningless choice that we go like slaves and say, oh, I voted 
voted. The limits of debate in this country are established before the debate even begins, and everyone else is marginalized. They're made to seem either to be communists or some sort of disloyal person, a kook, there's a word, and now it's conspiracy. See, they've made that something that should not be even entertained for a minute, that powerful people might get together and have a plan. Doesn't happen. You're a kook. You're a conspiracy buff. And of all the mechanisms of defense of this system, there are two that repeatedly come up. The first is this idea that the system has been the cause of the material progress we have seen on this planet. Well, no. There are basically two root causes which have created the increased so-called wealth and population growth we see today. One, the exponential advancement of production technology, hence scientific ingenuity and two, the initial discovery of abundant hydrocarbon energy, which is currently the foundation of the entire socioeconomic system. The free market, capitalist, monetary market system, whatever you want to call it, has done nothing but ride the wave of these advents with a distorted incentive system and a haphazard, grossly unequal method of utilizing and distributing those fruits. The second defense is a belligerent social bias generated from years of propaganda, which sees any other social system as a route to so-called tyranny, with various name droppings of Stalin, Mao, Hitler, and the death tolls they generated. Well, as despotic as these men might have been, along with the societal approaches they perpetuated, when it comes to the game of death, when it comes to the systematic daily mass murder of human beings, nothing in history compares to what we have today. Famines throughout at least the last century of our history have not been caused by a lack of food. They've been caused by relative poverty. The economic resources were so inequitably distributed that the poor simply didn't have enough money with which to buy the food that would have been available if they could have afforded to pay for it. That would be an example of structural violence. Another example. In Africa and some other areas, but well, I'll particularly focus on Africa, tens of millions of people are dying of AIDS. Why are they dying? It's not because we don't know how to treat AIDS. We have, you know, millions of people in the, in the wealthy countries are getting along remarkably well because they have the medicines that will treat it. The people in Africa who are dying of AIDS are not dying because of the HIV virus. They're dying because they don't have the money with which to pay for the drugs that would keep them alive. Gandhi saw this. He said the deadliest form of violence is poverty. And that's absolutely right. Poverty kills far more people than all the wars in history, more people than all the murderers in history, more than all the suicides in history. Not only does structural violence kill more people, than all the behavioral violence put together. Structural violence is also the main cause of behavioral violence. Oil is the foundation of, and that is present throughout the edifice of human civilization. There are 10 calories of hydrocarbon energy, oil and natural gas, and every calorie of food you and I eat in the industrialized world. Fertilizers are made from natural gas. Pesticides are made from oil. You drive oil-powered machines to plant, plow, irrigate, harvest, transport, package. You wrap the food in plastic, that's oil. All plastic is oil. There are seven gallons of oil in every tire. Oil is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. And it's only because of oil that there are seven billion people, or almost seven billion people on this planet right now. The arrival of this cheap, easy energy which is equivalent, by the way, to billions of slaves working around the clock, uh, changed the world in such a radical way over the last century. And the population has gone up 10 times. But by 2050, oil supply is able to support less than half the present world's population in their present way of life. So the scale of adjustment to live differently is just Enormous. The world is now using six barrels of oil for every barrel it finds. 
Five years ago, it was using four barrels of oil for every barrel it finds. A year from now, it's going to be using eight barrels of oil for every barrel it finds. What's disturbing to me is the lack of any real effort from governments worldwide or industry leaders worldwide to do something different. I mean, we have these sort of attempts to build more wind power, and to, to maybe do something with tide. We've got attempts to make our cars a little bit more um, efficient. But there's nothing which really looks like a revolution coming along. These are, these are all pretty minor. And that, I think, is pretty frightening. And the governments who are driven by these economists who don't really appreciate what we're talking about are trying to stimulate consumerism to restore past prosperity in the hope that they can restore the past. They're printing yet more money lacking any collateral at all. So if, if the economy improves and recovers and growth, the famous growth comes back, it'll only be short-lived because within a short period of time, counted in months rather than years, it'll hit the supply barrier again. There'll be another price shock and a deeper recession. So I think we go into a series of vicious circles. So you have the economic growth going up, price spike, everything shuts down, that's where we are now. Then it starts to come up again. But what we have now is this, is this area where there's, there's no more ability to produce cheap energy. We're at the peak. We're on the downslope of oil production. No way you're going to get any more out of the ground uh, any faster, uh, which means that things shut down the price of oil drops, which it did in the early 2009, but then as you have an ersatz so-called recovery, the price of oil starts to come back. It's recently been hovering around $80 a barrel, and, and what we see is at $80 a barrel now, with the economic and financial collapse, people are having a hard time affording that. World oil production uh, right now is about 86 million barrels a day. Over 10 years, you're looking at roughly 40, 40 million barrels a day having to be replaced. There's nothing around which can come even within a 1% of meeting that sort of demand. If we don't do something pretty quickly, there's going to be a huge energy deficiency. I think the big mistake is in not recognizing um, a decade or so ago that an effort, a concerted effort, needed to be made to develop these sustainable forms of energy. I think that's something our grandchildren will look back on with uh, total uh, disbelief. You people knew that you were dealing with a finite commodity. How could you possibly uh, have built your economy around something which was going to disappear? For the first time in human history, the species is now faced with the depletion of a core resource central to our current system of survival. And the punchline of the whole thing is that even with oil becoming more and more scarce, the economic system will still blindly push its cancerous growth model. So people can go out and buy more oil-powered cars to generate GDP and jobs, exacerbating the decline. Are there solutions to replace the edifice of the hydrocarbon economy? Of course. But the path needed to accomplish these changes will not manifest through the market system protocols required, since new solutions can only be implemented through the profit mechanism. People are not investing in renewable energies because there is no money in it in both the long and short term. And the commitment needed to make it happen can only occur at a severe financial loss. Hence, there is no monetary incentive. And in this system, if there's no monetary incentive, things do not happen. And on top of it all, peak oil is just one of many surfacing consequences of the environmental social train wreck gaining speed today. Other declines include freshwater, the very fabric of our existence, which is currently showing shortages for 2.8 billion people, and those shortages are on pace to reach 4 billion by 2030. Food production, the destruction of arable cropland, from which 99.7% of all human food comes from today, is occurring up to 40 times faster than it is being replenished. And over the last 40 years, 30% of the arable land has become unproductive. Not to mention that hydrocarbons are the backbone of agriculture today, and as it declines, so will the food supply. As far as resources in general, at our current patterns of consumption, by 2030 we will need two planets to continue our rates. Not to mention the continual destruction of life supporting biodiversity, causing extinction spasms and environmental destabilization across the globe. 
And with all of these declines, we have the near exponential population growth, where by 2030, there might be over 8 billion people on this planet. Energy production alone would need to increase 44% by 2030 to meet such demand. And again, since money is the only initiator of action, are we to expect that any country on the planet is going to be able to afford the massive changes needed to revolutionize agriculture, water processing, energy production and the like, when the global debt pyramid scheme is slowly shutting the entire world down? Not to mention the fact that the unemployment you currently see is going to become normality due to the nature of technological unemployment. The jobs are not coming back. And finally, a broad social perspective. From 1970 to 2010, poverty on this planet doubled due to this system. And given our current state, do you honestly think we will see anything less than more doubling, more suffering, and more mass starvation? There is not going to be any recovery. This is not some long depression that we're sudden someday going to pull out of. I think the next phase we're going to see after the next round of economic collapse is massive civil unrest. When employment checks stop being paid because the states have no money left. And when things get so bad that people lose confidence in their elected leaders, they will demand change if we don't kill each other in the process or destroy the environment. I'm just afraid that we might get to the point of no return. And that bothers me no end. We do all we can to avoid that condition. It's clear that we're on the verge of a great transition in human life that what we face now is this fundamental change of the life we've known over the last century. There has to be a link between the economy and the resources of this planet, the resources being, of course, all animal and plant life, the health of the oceans and everything else. This is a monetary paradigm that will not let go until it's killed the last human being. The in-group will do all it can to stay in power. And that's what you got to keep in mind. They'll use the army and navy and lives or whatever they have to use to keep in power. They're not about to give it up because they don't know of any other system that will perpetuate their kind.
Take a straight and stronger course to the corner of your life. Just remember that the goal is for us all to capture all we want. We have. Yourself. Move on back to your squares. Send an instant karma to me, and I shall live with love and care for yourself. 'Cause it's time, it's time and time with your time, and it's news is captured.